Hi, Madison. How are Hello. you? Good. How are you? Are you Emory? I am. Yes. Okay. Hi, Emory. Hello. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming today. Yeah. We're glad to be there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In some form or fashion. Right? I know, right? <laughs> All right, I did just make you the co-host when if you need to share your screen or anything, you should be good to go. And then if you're ready, I think we can go ahead and get started. I think some okay. people have already hopped on. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily okay. Lowski, events, events coordinator at the Ames Chamber of Commerce. And today we're here with Madison Che, and she's going to talk about her documentary, The Central Street Story, an urban renewal retrospective. We are so happy that she was able to make it, whether that's Zoom or in person. I'm glad you guys are here. I'm going to pass off to Madison and she's going to kick it off for you. Okay. Now, are we? Oh, we're not able to see others in the room. Correct. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Madison Deshay Duncan, and I'm sitting here with Richard Duncan. Um, my husband and partner um, in terms of all of the work that we do, particularly um, with the documentary. And so I kind of want to um, just kind of go over just a little bit of background about the documentary and our objective for it before I um, play a short, about eight minutes preview of the documentary. And I just kind of want you to kind of keep in mind First of all, as you're watching it, this documentary is about a community in Des Moines, Iowa. So it's uh, the Center Street story and urban renewal retrospective. However, it is a model for what kind of transpired across the country, including um, in, in parts of Ames. And so as you're watching it and listening to us um, and engaging in conversation with us, um, just kind of keep in mind your story in the context of Ames. And so, um, so one of our objectives for the documentary is really to provide the historic context, okay, of what has become known as inner city neighborhoods or central city neighborhoods. And really we have to think about it, these neighborhoods in a greater context of the city around it. In our case, it would be Des Moines. And so particularly the documentary addresses the social, political, and economic um, change and phenomenon of uh, urban renewal and the impacts that urban renewal had on this particular community um, that was located in Des Moines. And so with that being said, I want to go ahead and play the eight minutes um, preview, and then we will come back and, oh, well, Rich might want to say, Hello. Well, hello. <laughs> well, we'll wait until after. Okay. The and so I'm going to share the eight minute preview of the documentary. Give me a moment to. Get it set up for all of you. Center Street was the most prolific African-American community in Des Moines, Iowa for more than 50 years during the first half of the 20th century and had both cultural and economic impact far beyond its location on the northwest edge of the downtown business district. What made Center Street so prolific was that it was the hub. It was the hub that drew black folks from all different areas of Des Moines. See, we're talking about the east side of Des Moines, which had a black community, the south side. But most people would come to the Center Street, you know, for all social activities, so to speak. You know, that was the street. That, that was the magnet. Well, a Center Street was the area where people looked after each other and you went to get your hair cut. 
at the barber shop. You went to the beauty shop. She went to the restaurants. It, there wasn't, and the other thing was that we were not allowed to go to the white restaurants. So that's where, and some of the white businesses, so that's where you got what you needed. Uh, I can remember as a child, I felt safe on Center Street. Center Street was a city within a city. Uh, it had its own own business, own businesses, cleaners, laundries, or other types of business too. I wanted to work for myself. I felt a sense of more freedom, see, by working for myself. And first I used to sell general merchandise. I had a truck, a store at your door, and I, now after a store at your door, it's all, all different types of merchandise, cards, and uh, undergarments, and dresses, and pants. After that, why I fantasized in putting up a building on Center Street, this vacant lot. And uh, so uh, Mr. Hardaway, who was a barber on Center Street, was at the time the owner. And I remember being, buying it. I think I paid about, uh, uh, must have been four or $5,000 for the lot. I laid bridge. My first bar, I wanted to have a tavern, but I ended up having a laundromat there. And my father used to sell uh, different items, and he would. This was prior to going into business as a printer, and that's when he set up at uh, 12th and Keogh Way, his first printing place. And then after that, he moved up on 14th and Center, say where the business was until uh, the uh, renewal uh, wiped him out. I find it difficult to even talk about it now, honestly. When urban renewal was introduced during the 1950s, it was a tear-down, build-up program that occurred nationally. In Des Moines, urban renewal struck at the heart of the Center Street community, completely destroying the predominant African-American business district between 10th and 14th along Center and displacing the entire community. Well, with the freeway, it was, uh, it was pretty pronounced. I mean, they just said, we're going to build a freeway, and then they start building it. And our, where I live wasn't affected that much by the freeway. But for urban renewal, for years, they told my parents, don't make any significant changes in your property because we're not going to pay you for them. We're going to, urban renewal is coming through, and we're going to buy your property. And finally, they came through and started buying houses. And I can remember coming home from school, and my mother's eyes were swollen shut from crying because she had two parcels of property, and they paid her $3,000 for two parcels of property. And trying to buy a house, another house somewhere else, for that little bit of money, they robbed her. They didn't have much of a choice. And you know, you're, you're offered to move or it's going to be taken, you know. So there was a lot of dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction with uh, compensation for their, their businesses where uh, they weren't too satisfied, you know. Uh, when you look back upon it, uh, the disfavor was typical of, of a lot of urban renewal, not only in Des Moines, but anywhere, is that the people involved were not involved in any of the planning, had no say so. It was just that, you know, you're being moved. You have no choice. People seem to be disheartened. By the time we moved out of our house, it was like being in a ghost town. There was nothing left. There were, in fact, three major urban renewal projects in Des Moines that included the River Hills Project, the Lee Town Court Project, and the Oak Ridge Project that eventually wiped out the Center Street community. Center Street had uh, sounds of, of music coming from the club. You could just hear, you could just feel it was vibrant, you know, it's just a, a vibrant, a hub of activity. 
If you just wanted to see people, you'd see all types of people. They came down on Center Street in tuxedos and, and gowns and dress, dressed to the T. It was, it was class. It was black class. It was a community, uh, and it had everything. The Center Street history and the effects the 1950s urban renewal project had on this Iowa community remains largely untold. And through this brief sample of our proposed documentary, we have only just begun to reveal the story. The unique story of Center Street is obscure from educational resources because it has been overshadowed by the larger national history of urban renewal. As the story of Center Street continues to fade, it is imperative that we capture and preserve first-person perspectives. Our goal is to create a 90-minute documentary and companion curriculum that will add to and enrich the body of knowledge on Iowa's history that can also be shared nationally to help complete the picture of the impacts of urban renewal. With your support, we can complete this compelling documentary. Okay, so that is a preview of what is really going to be or is in the making um, for a 90 minute documentary. Um, and so with that being said, um, are there any questions or is there the ability for us to take questions, Emory? Yes, there is. There's a chat box and also a Q&A at the bottom of the screen that the attendees can type in. Okay, so we'll try to keep an eye on that. And if we miss that, if you can kind of let yeah. us know, because yeah. we're typically the kind of um, um, presenting this in a in an uh, in interacting and yeah. question and yeah. answers. And so, however, before I get to that, I'm going to kind of turn it over to Rich to kind of give you some context in terms of. Um, his experiences. I'm a I'm a historian, if you will, um, by my uh, research. I researched it, and this is associated with my uh, master's um, undergrad research. Um, however, Rich actually lived on Center Street, and so I really want him to kind of jump in and give you a little bit of um, background in terms of where this area is that we're talking about. And I'll kind of jump in there um, after he kind of shares a little bit of his background. I'm gonna share my screen. So if you wanna go ahead, Rich. And... Okay, very, very quickly, I'll give you a little background on myself as uh, I've earned the title of being the historian for this project. And one reason being is that my folks moved up on uh, Center Street when I was five years old. So this is uh, uh, back in 1956, 57. And uh, so we lived there and, and I was fortunate enough to experience Center Street through various degrees of my life. I mean, very chapters, uh, being five years old when we moved there uh, and we, we moved away from Center Street during the time of urban renewal and the freeway. So that was uh, back in the, the 50s. So I uh, this, the, uh, had the chance of, of meeting all the people from a, when I was a kid to an adult. So very briefly, uh, we came across this uh, project because Madison at one time uh, asked me a question. Uh, she didn't know that there was a black community in Des Moines and uh, she had never heard of it. I, I was very surprised that uh, she's not from Des Moines. She wasn't from Des Moines, but just her idea of there never being a black community in Des Moines kind of took me uh, by surprise. So I had to set her down and give her some explanations and all, the, all that time and those explanations and, and her being a history buff herself, 
uh, we could tell more information and more uh, interviews. And I just gave her details about the, the street in itself. And she took it from there. And so this, this project that we're having is an example of, of disbursement of people, a community that happens all over the United States. You know, we have information from uh, Kansas City, Omaha, Nebraska, Minneapolis, Denver, and such and such. So it's not just Center Street in itself. We're using that as an example of displacement of people through urban renewal or different other government projects. Now, my experience with Center Street is, is very detailed because like I said, I, I would go down through Center Street with my mother as a kid. You know, I would look in the, the windows at businesses. You know, it was a community that had everything that a community has. It has it, its drug stores, barber shops, pool halls, uh, restaurants, you know, nightclubs, record stores, just everything that you want to think about a, a community. And it was self it's, it, it, it lived off of itself, you know, and it was a small, it was, the area itself was small, but it could, it, it, it satisfied the whole community of Des Moines, not only the west side of Des Moines, but the east side, the south side. So I won't go a lot into detail as far as that, but that was uh, <clears throat> my experiences and that's how we got started with this documentary. So I don't know how much more detail she might want to step in. Yeah, so in thinking about Center Street, like we um, think about other central city or inner city neighborhoods that um, are predominantly people of color, we often think about a lot of the um, social aspect of the, of the neighborhood. And so really in thinking about um, Center Street at, this has been like 10 years in the making, by the way, but really it's, it's like Rich said, it's really driven on our passion to set, shed light on a social, economic, and political injustice of the mm -hmm. past that is very much connected to the present and future conditions of communities of color. So we have to think about not only what happened in the past, but we also are kind of considering how we can learn from the past to improve the future of communities that have typically been marginalized. And so although some may, the Sinistry story may be essentially a documentary about the loss of brick and mortar that occurred in the name of a natural progression that we call urban revitalization or development. Um, mm -hmm. For us and for all of those that uh, worked in the community, that lived in the community, um, really this, is, this has been our opportunity to give voice to a largely unknown part of the patch work quilt of Iowa's history, right? And so that this just, it doesn't just encompass the buildings as Rich will tell you that oftentimes where um, people of color live, particularly the black community in Des Moines is typically where white families used to live, where white business owners used to um, conduct their business from. And so the buildings in themselves as Rich typically says, were might have not have been um, valued in terms of tax dollars, right? And in terms of their worth, but it was what was happening within these communities that was also lost. Um, when you just take this program, um, Urban Renewal, which um, being a Chamber of Commerce, I'm, I'm sure that you all um, are um, aware of what Urban Renewal is and how it, um, um, kind of touches different communities, right? And the impact and the demise that of neighborhoods that can occur. Um, but this was a place where people called their home. And so for us, resurrecting and reconstructing the Center Street story is really, um, it has been really like a learning experience and we want it to be a learning experience, particularly for um, persons that are uh, and organizations that are in the business of development. 
I'm per particularly thinking about economic development. And so, as Rich said, we talked with city planners, business owners, et cetera. Um, and so really thinking about not only the structures themselves, but also what was happening in and outside of those structures um, from multiple perspectives that we don't often get a chance to hear from. And so I kind of want to um, move along to kind of really looking at, I told you that this story, this particular story is um, about the Center Street neighborhood and kind of give you a little background history um, before we go into uh, too much other detail. Um, it's this one. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be switching a little bit back and forth here. So when we're talking about these communities, we're talking about a lot of communities that are near downtown areas, right? And so those areas were redeveloped and Rich actually has a connection with a particular business owner that was in Ames during the same time period. Um, and he'll talk a little bit about that um, in a moment. But when we're thinking about the urban renewal and we're thinking about our particular project, we're talking about the Oak Ridge General Neighborhood Renewal Project, right? And this was like the fifth one, um, according to Jim Grant, who was a uh, the former director of community and economic development. And what he says is urban renewal was new to Iowa at the time, all across the state, it was the fifth one. And as I remember it, it started out to be designated a rehabilitation project, which we often hear um, in terms of our communities right before um, the uh, wrecking ball um, starts. And it was thought of more as a, uh, like I said, a rehabilitation project north of the freeway in Des Moines, um, which would have been um, a predominantly white area was north of, of the freeway, okay, where it was mainly housing. But then as the project continued, it became a total um, uh, redevelopment project, okay? And so, Right now, the picture that I showed you earlier is kind of the area um, where, if some of you are familiar with Des Moines, it's where the Oak, homes of Oak Ridge are and where Methodist Hospital is located at. So if you're looking at it in terms of where this is, this um, the Oak Ridge plan, you can see from what I'm showing on the screen, that's Keo. And so we're talking about that particular area. And so as Tim Board shared in the documentary, Center Street is just one example and a very good one of some of the dysfunctional aspects of planning at that time um, through the urban renewal effort. And that whole neighborhoods were just basically bulldozed for lack of a better term. The social and economic ramifications of disrupting such large areas, the family unit, the household unit, the small business was the least of consideration um, in that equation of the broader, bigger planning of the city. And what we've kind of come to learn throughout this process, um, we still have some of those practices still in place. And so that makes this project particularly re relevant at this time, at this moment in history. And so, as I said, we're talking about um, the 1950s to 1960s urban renewal in the United States, which was driven, of course, by the federal policies and fueled with federal funding. Um, and so that's what kind of led to this aggressive neighborhood clearance projects that, as we um, discuss in the documentary, disproportionately destroyed and displaced African-American communities throughout the United States. And so... I'm gonna skip through the legislation and really think about how this transpired um, from maybe a, more of a social aspect. And so during the early stages and throughout the process, the program was presented from what, we, what I've learned um, in, in the case of uh, Des Moines and the Center Street neighborhood 
that they're going to transform blighted areas into a place that was safe for children to play. It was really a lot of propaganda that, that transpired um, at that particular time. And so I want to kind of skip through the, the process a little bit. And so how this occur, occurred in Des Moines, we know that the clearance um, was part of a project area south of the freeway. And as I kind of discussed earlier, close to the downtown area. And so there were strict codes. Um, and then, like I said, clear a lot of clearance that took place. But what I actually have up on the screen that I wanted to show you was a lot of the propaganda that took place around that. And so particularly thinking about that social issue or that social component of urban planning. And so the other aspect of the Center Street neighborhood in terms of the propaganda, we also know that there were other projects taking place around the same time, one of which was the freeway, freeway route. And so when I began this um, particular study and documentary, it was always thought that it was the freeway that kind of disrupted uh, or, or took out Center Street. And um, throughout the, the research we found, well, no, that really wasn't the case. The freeway did serve to disrupt the area, but it, it did not take out the center street where the businesses were located along um, in between like 10th and 14th. Um, and it did not take out that particular part of the neighborhood. Do you wanna jump in there? Yeah, I will. I, at that time, yeah, I think I, Want to give you reference to actually where Center Street was in adjacent to the downtown area. Uh, what this is, is like uh, I, I have a term that I use uh, as the golden ghetto. And uh, a lot of time that's the way I describe the property that was a, was a, a located that Center Street contained, and meaning that it was adjacent to downtown Des Moines, okay? And uh, I know the city planners uh, looked at that street and seen value because, uh, like I said, the property didn't assess much, but the location and everything, it, it was golden. It was, it was right adjacent to downtown. Downtown was, uh, you know, biting at the bit, in essence, to get that property. Now, we said it was used for urban renewal, okay? And uh, it, urban renewal did, did happen, the Oak Ridge project, but the property that really contained the Center Street Business District uh, is now a parking lot and area owned by Iowa Methodist Hospital. Now that opened up a lot of uh, opinions and discussions about that and something that we don't go into in our documentary because we're not really trying to to open up a, any kind of can of worms or anything but uh so that that what you're seeing there now is the center street the boundaries, the boundaries of center street if i can just take you that yellow line and it's so it's not only the the, the businesses, like I said before, it's that whole community there that's outlined in yellow. Uh, that that was generally the black uh, area. Now, when I say black area, I have to I have to retract that too because I have to give you a little description on that community. It was not just a black community. This is very important. Uh, when I grew up, there was Italians there, you know, whites, Greeks. Jews, everything. It was a mixed area. And, and so uh, sometimes I have to watch myself because I, I, I want people to realize that this was just not a Black community. It was primarily Black, but it was a very multicultural community. And it, it had, we had doctors and lawyers and uh, Judge Glanton, the first Black judge in Iowa, just lived right up the street from me. We had funeral homes. We had community centers. We had just everything. And what you see in that yellow lined area, all of those things were displaced. You know, they were displaced at that time. So I, I just wanted to reference that 
And I don't know, maybe if before she goes any further, or I can get back. You want me to get back mm -hmm. to the names? Yeah, now? talk, make that connection. Now, I, I, there, I have a real heartfelt connection with Ames because when I was a kid, uh, my uncle had a barbecue place in Ames, and it was Brownie's Open Pit Barbecue. And I don't know if any of you are watching or old enough to remember that, but he uh, was even referenced in the Ames Tribune in May of 1960, and she'll put this up. And his place was located on, off of Kellogg, 203 Kellogg. And it was, a, it was like a little gold mine for him, for him as far as business sense, you know. And he operated that business uh, for, gosh, for many a year. And um, what happened was that the city decided or this, let's just say the city bought his property for a parking lot, you know, and uh, it was it was a blessing in disguise for him. Uh, he hated to leave Ames, but he he left Ames and relocated in Des Moines and continued. But he was uh, Brownie's Open Pit Barbecue was well known throughout the state of Iowa uh, as being very successful and good barbecue. And he hated to leave up there, and people hated to see him go. But uh, that's a tie I have in with Ames. And uh, uh, he was very successful up there for over 15 years or so, probably. And so again, if you think about this urban renewal and revitalization in the context of Ames, and you think about where Kellogg is at um, and how that area developed, you kind of can see the same type of, of development occurring um, in Ames as it did in Des Moines where you kind of began to see this marginalization um, to a greater degree of black business owners. And give me a moment and I'm going to Sharing my screen, I'm kind of switching around. So basically at that time you had, as Tom Urban, who was the former mayor at that time, we've interviewed for the documentary, or I should say the late Tom Urban, you had two huge geographical disruptions without a lot of attention to the social consequences for that. And the cleaning out of that in the late 50s and 60s basically dislocated many, many people, particularly people of color and people of poverty at that time. And so did folks kind of um, challenge those? Absolutely, they did. And so I showed you that earlier propaganda or material um, from the city of Des Moines. And then groups started forming in terms of um, the Concerned Citizens Association. And so um, because of the unjust and, un and unfairness of the practices, and thinking about in terms of practices with urban renewal, part of the problem was um, people were not getting paid um, what their property was worth um, or given enough to really relocate um, and start over, start a new business. And a lot of people say that, um, yeah, these were mixed neighborhoods and this happened um, when Rich was talking about um, Greeks and Jews and different ethnicities, different um, ethnic backgrounds or racial groups. And yes, that is true. The problem for the Black community was that they were not, is, rebounding did not come as easy um, at that particular time. And so as uh, Mel Lloyd, who also interviewed for this and had an experience in Davenport in the Quad Cities, where one of the urban renewal projects transpired, um, he put it um, in terms of, you know, you can't just pick up every 10, 15 years and move because most of these um, stores, most of these businesses, as he described, were mom and pop organizations and they were, they had shoestring budgets, right? And so they weren't really able to redevelop to the degree that other um, groups were. And so in addition to that, there were, um, um, I've lost my chain of thought, <laughs> petitions that were signed by people in the neighborhood. 
And as Mr. DePatton, who you saw in the in the um, documentary preview, he said that um, they have created a problem of displaced persons where none existed before. The only place they can go now is back to substandard housing. And that was a, a, a feeling of individuals that I interviewed, um, that we interviewed for this project kind of across the board. And so really thinking about this, well, despite this uh, move by the concerned citizens, because there really wasn't a lot of power, right? It matters who's at the table when these decisions are being made and when development is um, occurring throughout a city. So there wasn't that power um, that these communities had. And so of course, all across the United States, and you may find a few cases where it was successful, but they are few and far between. And so ultimately the Center Street neighborhood was um, destroyed. Mm -hmm. I think this is a good time. You may have the question, what happened to the businesses on Center Street? Where did they go? Okay. She's already told you that we they were not properly paid. One guy on the barbershop, he actually took his case to court. And uh, he got less money after, through the court proceedings. So the businesses that were on Center Street, they relocated. Uh, one one uh, guy owned the barbershop, he built a brand new barbershop up on uh, University, which was further north uh, in the city. And uh, the, one of the nightclub owners built a brand new uh, nightclub. And so the community in itself, as far as businesses, they started development on the street on University Avenue. And uh, it never uh, really uh, got the old flavor of Center Street because here's what happened. Uh, once they got settled, new businesses were up on a relocated. Uh, the city once again came and uh, had uh, city planners had ideals for that area again, okay? So what happened? It further moved the businesses that had relocated from Center Street to University and they took their properties and they moved, uh, some of them never opened up again, you know. So so going back again and thinking about how cities develop and how businesses are able to uh, either thrive or um, not, um, we have to consider what's happening at different levels, right? Particularly in terms of city government, in terms of investment, in terms of um, supports that are um are being given. And so we do know that what happened in the Center Street area, and particularly at that time, we have to consider, um, and remember this is giving you a historic context um, for what we're seeing today. And so at that time, we also had the Model Cities era, right? And so you had this influx of funding um, coming into neighborhoods. And, and so, some of that money, a lot of that money was meant to kind of correct some of the ills of um, urban renewal. And but however, what ended up happening was that we ended up with a lot of social service agencies as opposed to economic uh, development. And so and we we are experienced that in terms of a long term um, outcome of urban renewal. So, and we can see that, and we can see how that shows up um, in terms of the education system, in terms of the health system. Um, and because we all know that these systems are interconnected, right? They're all, they all relate. Um, and so what happens in, in when you, um, when neighborhoods are destroyed or displaced and then marginalized, and then they experience disinvestment, um, what ends up happening is, we don't want to, or the city then has a reason, if you will, or justification, if you will, for not investing in that area, because then the argument becomes, well, the area is, we're not going to get back a return on our investment. And then you also have this idea of developers not wanting to, or major developers not wanting to develop in the neighborhood. 
And so what has happened over time is we call it, I have a master's in regional planning and we call it leakage, right? And so the employment that is that folks have in our neighborhood, right? It's going out of the community as opposed to coming in um, in terms of being able to reinvest. And that's not only in terms of economic development, um, in terms of business, but that's infrastructure. That's um, streets, that's pavement. Um, we um, exist with unpaved roads or incomplete um, uh, roads that are not fixed or we get the patchwork and, and that type of thing. And so those resources become fewer and fewer and fewer be, over time. And so it's a, um, a kind of um, a, a cycle. And so one of the ways that I kind of want to wrap up what I'm talking about and kind of put it in a different type of a context is if you think about how you make a loaf of bread, right? You really need to have all of the ingredients in order for that bread to come out correctly, particularly the yeast, right? Because that's going to make the bread rise. And so if we take that kind of this analogy and we think about um, the development or lack thereof of communities such as ours, and we're in the King Irving neighborhood, which is where a lot of um, displaced families moved to at that particular time, um, including um, Richard's family um, who bought a house that he still owns in this um, area. But if you, if you leave out the yeast, the bread's not going to rise. And so what has happened, um, think about it this way. We have social input. We have a lot of social organizations. Um, but we don't have a lot of political power, um, that being at all levels of government, um, including those bodies that are responsible for economic development and nurturing that. And we don't have, so, so if we don't have the political power then we don't have the economic power. And so in thinking about that loaf of bread, what's missing and why these communities don't um, thrive or rise um, is because we're missing an ingredient and that ingredient being that economic development. Um, and so kind of to wrap up the uh, impacts, a couple of statements I just kind of want to share with all of you and how people really felt about um, the loss of their community, of that um, cohesiveness, of that um, ability to be self-sustaining. And part of the reason that the communities were self-sustaining that we need to um, make sure we point out is because the segregation was um, alive and well at that particular time. And so a lot of the residents or former residents that I interviewed said, we just couldn't go to, to the downtown places um, or some of them, many of them, or we experienced discrimination at those places. Um, and so anyway, um, Akeo Abdul Samad, one of our Iowa legislators, uh, legislator said, we just lost everything that we had. People weren't given the money, their homes were worth, they were relocated. Now here in the area where we're sitting, Rich and I are literally sitting in this area on the west side of town or north of university, um, that we weren't even welcomed at one point that we didn't even get to experience. And when he's saying to experience, he's talking about as Rich Kind, or we talked about earlier in terms of black people move where white people used to be. And so we're always moving into these older areas uh, or being pushed into older areas. Uh, Melvin Harper, everybody was disappointed because it just broke up our togetherness. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Mel Lloyd, uh, the majority of the Black people started businesses on a shoestring. It's a mom and pop organization, and you don't have the economic stature to pick up a business and move it. <clears throat> and Richard, I can let you tell what you said since you're sitting here. Um, so there was problems with urban renewal all over the United States. When you look back on it, the disfavor was typical of a lot of urban renewal, not only in Des Moines, but anywhere and everywhere. The people involved were not involved in any of the planning. They had no say so. It was just that you're being moved. You had no choice. 
And Tim Borch finally says, um, so few people understand this as part of the Iowa experience. It's not something that you pick up at the state fair, and yet it is. It's as much a part of Iowa as any other part of it. And so I kind of, um, I'll leave this on the screen and you can kind of look at that. Um, but are there any, do you want to add anything before yes. I kind of open it up? And so really, what's the point of all of this, right? And so the point is to really, as I said, the objective is to really think about the historic context of development and how and what it's looked like over time and to really kind of learn from those past um, mistakes um, in terms of not just the social impact, but the economic impact, the political um, impact on neighborhoods, thinking about how communities are impacted. Again, as I said, with those other systems, the health system, the judicial system, um, the education, since I am an educator, um, the education system, and think about what that looks like in terms of the overall growth of a neighborhood. And so really thinking about the documentary, we're hoping to like really push um, folks that have the power, right? To kind of consider who's at the table when we're planning neighborhoods, right? Or who's at the table um, to talk about these issues of marginalization and disinvestment and what that looks like. And so um, specifically, like I said, thinking in terms of the public and private support um, that the businesses that the few businesses that are still there are receiving. Now I will say um, in Des Moines, we do have a, um, they're calling it a center at, at six on um, Sixth Avenue where they're going to create an incubator um, for businesses. And so I don't necessarily know that that will bring back the flavor of center of the Center Street neighborhood because we've evolved over time. And um, it really takes a whole community to support those businesses that will go into um, that center at sixth. But it is a step. And so that is really um, the purpose, I will say, or the outcomes that we're kind of looking for is thinking about different initiatives that we can take considering the historic context of, of uh, where we've been with neighborhoods. And I can let Rich kind of close out no, his what thoughts. I, what I will say, times, times have changed. Uh, when we go into the history of Center Street, we also have to think about the, the time periods. You know, Center Street was, you know, 1923 or so in the, 26 when the center street uh moved to center street it was located further uh, south at one time but as far as center street in itself uh it has a history dating back to the to the 20s 1926 or so uh it was very prominent it was associated with uh, uh they had the the black uh wax uh which is the women's uh uh soldiers mm -hmm. uh they came to Center Street. Uh, and like I said before, it was like a hub. Uh, and why did we have Center Street? Well, we couldn't go to clubs downtown. We couldn't go to restaurants. You know, uh, I remember going to, to drugstores with my mother and we sat in the colored section. You know, we sat in the colored section in the movie theaters and such and such. So you have to look at the time period and in reference to the area wise, uh, Des Moines in itself was much smaller, you know, it, it was, and with being 4%, well, it's 4% Black uh, or people of color now, but back when I was a kid, uh, you know, the places now that are suburbs were farmland back then, you know, so it was a much smaller area. Uh, and I say that in reference to now, you know, now we have uh, community suburbs that have, you know, we have uh, people of color all throughout the city. So I don't believe we, or I speak for myself, to ever see another area that will be primarily self-contained uh, as a, a, a Black community, 
per se, uh, only because of uh, uh, the, the, man, the dimensions of the city have, mm -hmm. have grown so much and consequently it disperses uh, people of color, and, which is not bad. So I'm not saying that in, in a negative way. Uh, the city of Des Moines has grown and it has not, uh, it has not stopped anyone from, from being very successful in whatever they want to do. Uh, however, the, the point I think is equity. And so that's really essentially what we're thinking about is um, being equitable across communities and across populations in the context of built communities. Are there any questions for us? I actually have a question for you both. Um, what was your favorite part about the documentary that you filmed? And then also what was the most difficult part about filming the documentary? Oh, the difficult part. The difficult part was funding, I think, because we this has been a long time in the making. That's always going to be the most difficult part. However, I think for me, um, really being able to connect and uh, with a generation um, and, and gain a greater understanding in the relationships that I was able to form, um, the knowledge I was able to gain. I think talking to Mr. DePatton, I would really have to say always stands out to me. Um, the, the emotion, um, just his ability to put me um, back, uh, put me not back on, but put me on Center Street um, and be able to just kind of walk in their shoes. So through the documentary, I've really been able to walk in. Um, I, I really think that I was there, I mean, at this point. And so that was my I, favorite part. I think the thing, that we have found uh, when we started, when I answered her question way yeah. back when uh, about community, uh, the answers that I was giving her at that time, we had no idea that this would lead to a documentary. I introduced her to some people and she, you know, just it got to be in that she was interviewing and such and such. A, and so much uh, material was being gained at that time that when we finally decided, well, hey, let's just put this in a documentary. Now, what was so hard, <laughs> and, and anyone that does uh, <laughs> documentaries know that, we have tons of footage, and when we were yeah. trying to make a 90-minute documentary, and, and uh, our editors and people connected said, you guys just, you're gonna have to start cutting. You're just gonna have to start cutting, yeah. cutting, cutting. So we're not actually doing a history of the people on Center Street, because we could do a series on just the activities and how the life of, of the community actually was in person. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to boil it down into just not the people and their you know, personalities, but just in general, the community is we can use this to uh, connect with other urban areas uh, as far as development that had the same kind of experience of being displaced, their neighborhoods, their community per se. Okay. You know, you could go to Kansas City, they had their community, you know, right up here in Omaha, Nebraska had its 24th Street community. And all of those communities for Everybody. at one time mm -hmm. uh, experienced the same thing in Center Street. So yeah, it was very difficult just in boiling this down and to make a reference to the association with urban renewal, renewal and displacement of People, I, so. I can tell you this, that one of the other things that I think is really profound for me is just really being able to give voice to, like I said, like Mr. DePat and people that had no voice at that time in, in a way that, um, that others can connect to. So what I mean by that is that, and before the documentary, I actually created an exhibit um, with the artifacts, some artifacts from Center Street. And so to hear people say, yeah, I can remember, like Rich is saying that, yeah. you know, my community, I think that that's really profound. And um, I want to note that the documentary is, I'm not in it, maybe until the end, but um, it's really told through their voice, through the voice of the people that actually lived and experienced it. And so to be able to do that is, it's an honor. Yeah. Any we, other questions?
All right. If no one has any other questions or you think of any later, go ahead and pass them on to me and I can definitely get those to Madison and oh, hopefully she'll be able to take that over from you. But a second. Oh, where can we watch? Um, the um, the documentary in its entirety has not been released yet. Uh, once it is, we will be holding screenings. And so um, we will make sure that the Ames Chamber of Commerce gets that information. Okay, Emery, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Sorry, I did not see that question come through. Um, thank you all for joining us again. And thank you, thanks to you both for getting on here and talking about this documentary. I think we're, after that, we're all pretty excited for it to get released and see the final thing. So, and I also want to thank our sponsors, Kingland, the Smith Law Firm, and the Iowa State Research Park for making these events possible. Again, if you guys have any other follow-up questions that you didn't get answered today, go ahead and reach out to me and I'll pass those along to Madison. But I think if there's anything else you guys want to mention, no, just thank you all for, you know, for enjoying and listening to us share our story. Awesome. Well, thank you both again. And uh, we'll be chatting soon, I'm sure. But thanks, everyone. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.